All right, welcome everyone to the Edge of Things. Uh, I'm Frédéric Debien, I manage IoT and edge computing programs at the Eclipse Foundation. And today I have friends from Red Hat and we'll have a little conversation about Rust. So maybe Jens and Ulf, uh, we'll start by uh, introductions. So. Yes, hey, my name is Jens. Uh, I work at Red Hat in the area of middleware IoT and uh, on the project Drove IoT mostly. My name is Ulf. Uh, I work with Jens on the same team, um, focusing mostly on the embedded side. All right. So, yeah, this is a broad conversation about Rust, and, and then we'll delve specifically into why Rust is a good fit for embedded slash IoT types of projects. But we first take a step back and talk a bit about the language. So, why are so, uh, both of you are so interested in the Rust language exactly? That's a really good question. So um, I, I learned about Rust uh, like several years back now uh, from a colleague that introduced me to that. I was like, okay, eager. There's a new language, there's new technology. I want to check it out. Uh, but but then when you start to play with that, um, it actually is quite fun. And if you take a look at Stack Overflow, where it's the most loved language for years, um, you don't know why, but you feel it. And um, so you continue to use it, and uh, you get used to it. And then you find out that technically it's awesome. Okay. So when we talk about technical advantages, what kind of advantages has it over other options in the market then? Well, uh, there's uh, two, two things, uh, I think. Uh, if you're writing uh, concurrent systems, mm -hmm. uh, Rust has some real benefits uh, when it comes to uh, uh, detecting um, data races in the, in the code at compile time. Um, and also on embedded in particular, um, there's a lot of shared resources on the device that you need to make sure that uh, is only in use in one context at a time. Uh, so those are the two areas, at least where I've seen Rust really shine. So things like buffer overflows and race conditions, you don't get them literally? Yes. So this is, I think, a common problem of, of C, uh, where you have all access to all memory inside mm -hmm. the application, and that is maybe great, uh, maybe not so. So uh, what, what I really liked when I prepared a talk about Rust um, several years back, there was a, a blog post from Microsoft where they analyzed where the um, security issues come from, and 70% of those came from um, memory access where they should not access. So all those security flaws, 70% of those could have been eliminated, would they have used Rust? Um, and that's, I think, a good argument for the language. Um, yeah, indeed, because you, you, you get those, 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 when you have issues, you have them, as Wolf mentioned, that at compile time, not right. at a random time right. when your device is in the field 500 kilometers from right. you and that... The compiler refuses to compile that code and the bug never exists. Wow, that's really something, and, and for me, that's really the one most attractive thing about it, although, you know, I must qualify that by saying, you know, as a program manager, mm -hmm. I still code, but for fun, so of course I'm not in the daily pain of trying to debug yeah. programs and all of that, but to me this is really attractive and I love the language as well. Now, one thing that was a bit difficult maybe in the past about Rust is that the, the language was not really well defined and evolving a lot and changing from one release to another. So where are we standing at this point in time with that? So, like, yes, you're right. So Rust is an evolving language. So the, the whole ecosystem still evolves. Um, it's a little bit slower, I would say, than, mm -hmm. than before. Um, but Rust has those uh, editions now. So you have an edition 2015, 2018, 21. Uh, and I think this brings a little bit more stability to, to the language. Um, but still, it is evolving. Yeah. On Embedded, for instance, we're using a lot of the nightly uh, builds uh, Rust just because it uh, has a few features that are very convenient uh, when you're building uh, embedded applications. Okay. So, uh, but but like it's the nice thing with the additions is that you they got they take a group of these features and say that these are going to be. Uh, supported from yes. the Okay, edition. so you have a clear roadmap on there, where you stand. There, for there is an RFC process actually, which is open okay. to the community where you can submit new language features, and that takes a while, so that is a, a lengthy process, mm -hmm. but this also ensures that the features are really um, suitable for prime time, that they're suitable for yeah. the, the final release. So we could say that there's a big advantage there compared to, let's say, Go, where it's more of a single vendor thing and they decide what goes in the language or not. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So um, everyone can contribute that. And it, I, I don't say it's an easy process mm -hmm. uh, because you have to convince uh, a lot of people that this is the right approach uh, for, for language. But this also ensures that this is not some, some new feature that gets dropped into the language. Um, it will be there for, for years to come. Uh, and it has to compile projects um, that have um, like a better output. And they don't, all those lifetime guarantees and the safety that this still exists. Yes, okay. So now let's switch gears a bit and, and really focus on the embedded and IoT uh, context uh, for, for Rust applications. So from what I understand, what makes Rust special there is that you can use, let's say, the full fab version and then run on the top on, on the operating system, whatever that would be. But you can also go, let's say, a lower level and then you can write bootloaders or operating system themselves in Rust. So uh, can you can you describe a bit to uh, our audience uh, what what kind of features we can expect from Rust in the embedded space? Yeah, so um, in Rust there's basically two two modes. Uh, you have uh, you can build programs with a standard library like mm -hmm. you usually do with uh, regular applications, and you have a let's say no STD uh, mode, uh, which is uh, you only have access to the core language. And this subset of Rust um, can compile to all the uh, um, uh, targets that LLVM, the, the backend compiler, can compile to. So this means you can compile to all embedded targets, um, also browsers, uh, and even on PC. So uh, um, it's really nice to, to be able to... Uh, basically, it allows you to reuse dependencies as well. You can use embedded dependencies in PC software mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So that's that's a really nice benefit. Th that's actually really great. Like like you mentioned, uh, it, it can run in the browser. It's WebAssembly. So uh, if the library you're using is capable of running in this core or no STD area, um, then you can take the code uh, from the backend to the front end, and it runs in your web browser. Yeah, because uh, of course you can go to a bigger target, so to speak, and then no changes required. It will run because it's it's designed for this very low level type of environment in what you call no STD. Yeah, exactly. So um, of course the browser doesn't give you all the APIs that an operating system, standard operating system, would give you for mm -hmm. good reason. Yeah, because you download something from the internet <laughs> and run it on on your browser. Um, but, but still, you can leverage all those existing crates, those dependencies that Rust offers you, the whole Rust ecosystem that is capable of running in, in no STD environment, and can run that inside the browser and can render HTML locally and stuff, and it's pretty fast. Okay, and then, of course, uh, we keep discussing Rust in the embedded context, so how small can your programs be? Oh, uh, it's, it's on the, it, you can uh, make them smaller than if you use a regular C RTOS, for instance. Uh, that's uh, that's on the limit of the LLVM, which decides uh, how big the program is. Really, um, the Rust compiler optimizes a lot, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, we can <laughs> run. And we, of course, as with embedded, you have limited RAM, limited flash, um, but it's certainly on uh, comparable to C when it comes to to, to most embedded applications. And that's not necessarily common. I mean, there are few languages that can compete with C in that particular department. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think like the, the Rust language um, is a very strict language, but this also provides the compiler with a lot of information to optimize. Um, so whenever there's something not needed, it can strip it out or can, can optimize for size or for speed. Mm -hmm. And and certainly in IoT and embedded, that's a very important concern, and it's great to have that flexibility. Absolutely. Now, uh, you mentioned this in your introduction, uh, Jens, you are involved in the Drog IoT project, and, and Drog IoT, of course, is written in Rust, so can you elaborate a bit about the project and what it does? Yeah, so, so Drog IoT um, basically consists of, of two main parts. One is the Drog device side, which is the, the embedded microcontroller side, and the other one is the Drog cloud side, which is the cloud backend, uh, which gives you like IoT-friendly APIs for, for cloud side. Um, or Kafka, maybe as a backend. Um, so the idea is uh, you register millions of devices with, with a backend, and then you stream data uh, to the cloud side, and then you have some applications behind that, consuming the data and making use of that, uh, feeding back commands to the, to the devices. 
Um, while it's called Drog IoT and Drog Device and Drog Cloud, um, you can use each of those individually. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no need to, to combine that. Um, but of course, we try to have a uh, better together approach uh, that this works for. Yeah, us. they are built together, tested together, and so you can expect things to work out of the box. Yeah. So that's a great thing. Uh, now, for me as a French speaker, it was you know the name was was funny because <laughs> drug in French yes. is the word for drugs. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so so uh, for for maybe non-German speakers uh, uh, that are watching this, so what's the uh, the actual meaning of the name for the project? It's, it's not a German word. By the way, it's uh, like it's uh, I think a parachute that uh, drags uh, ships in the right direction gives a bit stability. Mm -hmm. uh, that that is the idea. Um, but yes, naming is hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, once, once you try Rust, you get hooked on it. So it's yeah, that's true. Thinking, uh, in that sense. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right. Um, so now, uh, what would be the advantage of using a drogue device? Let's say I have this microcontroller, I need something to write. So why would I put? Uh, why would I use a drogue device versus going in a pure embedded Rust approach? Let's say. Well, um, I think uh, one of the things we emphasize with drug device is the, um, the IoT part, mm -hmm. uh, where, um, where we provide uh, not only drivers uh, for various um, uh, wireless chips, uh, but we also uh, provide libraries for doing HTTP and uh, QTT to the cloud. Um, and we have a lot of examples for different ports uh, that you can run against uh, Drogue Cloud, but you can also run it against, you know, AWS if you want to. It's uh, the, but the point is like being a very IoT um, focused uh, REST variant. But we try to not sort of uh, hide the REST embedded community. Mm -hmm. we, we we more try to uh, work with it, to contribute everything we can that makes sense into the upstream uh, REST embedded. And then whenever there's something that's drogue specific or to our project, then we, we keep it in drogue device. So it's kind of a best Maybe way. that's the right point to big, give a big shout out to Embassy, the, the project that's behind it. Exactly. So um, Embassy, which uh, was started by uh, uh, one of the Rust community members, mm -hmm. um, which uh, I think is using it in his product for his company, um, is a very unique and new approach to embed it, I would say. Uh, Running, um, using, making use of the Rust language uh, features like async uh, to provide both low power and uh, efficient code. So uh, it's uh, kind of a foundation, I guess, for uh, probably. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so if I understand you well, compared to plain embedded Rust, the advantage of of draw device and and of course, the draw cloud platform that goes with it. It's it's really uh, an accelerator if you have in mind a kind of IoT use case. Everything is pre-configured for you, so you can focus on the actual problem rather than build everything yourself. We could present it that way. The, absolutely, yeah. and that, that's the idea of the whole stack, like the the device side and the cloud side. So the idea is to bring together um, the the data that you generate somewhere with sensors uh, to the application that consumes that on the cloud side. Okay, and I think we were as we were preparing this uh, this session, you mentioned as well that there's a uh, Rust as a language is uh, very attractive for developers, but that there's great tooling for for that as well. So can you uh, elaborate a bit on that? Absolutely. So I, I think if you take a look at back at, at the Java world, so Java mm -hmm. grew for for many many years and has great tooling uh, like Maven or Gradle or whatever. Like mm -hmm. you can actually pick uh, what what works best for you, but it's. Uh, it's awesome. Um, and based on that, there's actually languages that build a little bit more in the same direction. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Rust really takes over there uh, with, with Cargo and then the other tooling where you have plugins that you can bring into that ecosystem, where you have um, actually uh, built, built scripts made in Rust itself um, that are part of the, 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 the process. You have the dependency management, you have trees, you have all this fancy stuff that you would look for, code generation on the fly, um, so I think there's there's great tooling. Yeah, yeah, and in, in particular for embedded, you get this for embedded as well as regular applications, and that's not something you see in uh, traditional embedded space, where you usually need to use a specific uh, tool or platform that does that's not tied to the language at all. Mm -hmm. But in Rust, you write embedded application like any other application, really. That's yeah. that's actually very good to mention that because. Um, 
if you think about setting up a tool chain for cross compiling for embedded targets, that can mm -hmm. be a super hard task. Oh, that's painful. That is painful. And with Rust, you can actually manage it. So you just say, uh, well, git clone, uh, cargo build, and that's it. Mm -hmm. That's the setup of the tool chain. Nice. And there's, uh, there's even a project for writing uh, a library for interacting with these debug probes that you typically use for embedded devices. Mm -hmm. So with this library, you can sort of build your own software to, to program your device and it opens up so many interesting possibilities. Yeah, so, so the whole tooling is available as a library basically um, as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can extend the tooling or embed the tooling as you like. Yeah. And, and, and so to me, uh, to my uh, uninformed eyes, uh, since unfortunately I don't develop on a daily day, but for me, uh, you've got the technical advantages of Rust that we discussed earlier, uh, great tooling, and another advantage is the neutral, vendor neutral governance around it. The fact that there's the Rust Foundation that, uh, let's say, sets the playground for contributors so that there's an equal playing field, plus the RFC process that you uh, talked about to uh, really manage the evolution of the language. So uh, for me, that's a tremendous advantage compared to some other options, right? Absolutely. And uh, like, like Rust comes out of the Mozilla Foundation. Um, it's now more, much more independent. Um, and I think it will grow in that direction. Uh, and I think also this is the reason why there is like some uptick in interest in, in Rust. And uh, you see everywhere, like even in the Linux kernel, uh, there is Rust now. Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, well, this is surprising uh, <laughs> knowing uh, the history of conservatism, yes. let's say, in that particular community. So it's great to see Linus yeah. to be uh, but a bit less grumpy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Except new thing. Obviously, it's a value add for the Linux kernel too. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, yeah. Because it makes sense. I mean, systems programming is uh, sensible to race conditions and, and memory buffer overflows and yeah. things like that. So, of course, uh, it's a good application for it. And uh, even in our Eclipse ecosystem, we see uptake of interest in Rust. We have the Zeno project, the PubSub protocol built from the ground up for the edge. And it's in Rust and it's great. And yeah. then it's got all of those language bindings, of course, to integrate with yeah. existing uh, application. So uh, my expectation is that we'll see the footprint of Frost grow at the Eclipse Foundation certainly uh, yeah. in the next years. Not only at the Eclipse Foundation, but also like in the industry in general. Oh yeah, absolutely. We can feel that. All right. Well, that would be, I think, the end uh, at this point of our conversation. Uh, Jens, Ulf, thank you so much for taking a few minutes out of your uh, busy schedules uh, oh, right here. to speak <laughs> with me. Uh, and for the audience, well, thank you for watching us. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this particular conversation about Rust. I'm Frédéric Devien uh, from the Eclipse Foundation. Thank you for watching The Edge of Things and see you next time.